Uh, hello, everyone. I think is we are in the restaurant time, 4 or, 4 or 5. So how is everyone doing? Good. So I want to uh, start by uh, classifying, making a little machine learning here. Can you, can, in this sparse data set, can you raise your hand if you are from the United States or Americas in general? So we have one. And the rest of the people, let's say Europe. Okay, and the rest, uh, Asia. Okay, so let's see that. I can say that we have three clusters and another small one. So I, the, the reason I'm asking that is because when I was planning this presentation, I recently reread a book that is called The Culture Map. And in this book, they, they said that when people from a certain part of the, of the world try to explain a concept in Germany, for example, is the, is the use case they put there, people appreciate that you start building the theoretical framework and then you show the demo. And where I am from, from Americas, we like, as we say, show me the money, show me the demo, show me how it works, why is this good, and then let's dig into the theory. So I say I need to first classify the audience because the, this is like choose your own adventure. I can either start with a demo or with a presentation and because we, since we only have three Americans here, I will start with the, the theoric, theoretic framework. But anyways, there will be a little bit of code. So thank you so much for coming. This presentation is inspired in one use case of things that we have been working at GitLab. When the idea is that we want to learn what are our customers, community, and in general, end users facing some challenges or they have uh, questions about the product. So I hope, and, and if, if you haven't, I hope that one day you have this, this feeling. Have you ever experienced this feeling when you start, when you know that you're about to use a data source that has been untouched and you are like, okay, I wonder what I will learn from this. Let's see what patterns I will be able to uncover. So that type of feeling, I have been feeling these recent months working with huge database of, of questions technical questions and in general questions about GitLab that we collected from different sources. And the idea then is that let's start from why are we here? So we said we have this thing, but let's define the problem that we need, that we want to solve. So first question. So the first question is the main problem and the other ones let's call it soft problems. So where do our end users need help to better use GitLab? This, this was one question, C-level question that was thrown out there. Second is, have these areas where they need help uh, evolved over time? Because maybe what was relevant two years ago is irrelevant today while using the product in this case. There was a new feature that today is mature, so maybe something that was a big issue, today it disappeared. And then, what can we do about it? So let's say that if we are able to answer these three questions, I will say that we solved the problem and we have already some sort of criteria of success. So this is why we started doing this thing. And now what is, uh, before solving a problem, you usually ask yourself, so what are the tools or what do I have available to solve this problem? So we have, as I mentioned in the beginning, years of broad questions, mostly technical questions, but later we found that there are all sorts of uh, questions, comments, opinions, when it comes to product usage. We also have a very strong team that they do user research. So they take, they make surveys and they interview power users, let's call it, and from different uh, clusters. And then they create a um, summary of this type of person and this persona, these are the type of challenges that they face. But how many of you feel excited to answer a survey? So that's, that's a tough one, right? But if you are upset or you are facing something, maybe you are more willing to create a, 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 to add a question on Stack Overflow or raise a support ticket. So, so this was solid, the UX research, but the sample was very small and it was in many cases, let's say, based on certain anecdotes. Someone will say, ah, oh, usually have this, but we, we cannot really extrapolate from one person's opinion or 15. And the, the third uh, component that we have available is the domain knowledge, which this domain knowledge is 
part of the reason of the name of this presentation, which is combining the best of two words, because when we have domain knowledge, when we have people that they know what they are doing uh, in the context of our application or business, we can model certain uh, business rules to extract information or, or as, as it's called in, in regular ML inform, information retrieval that is based on certain rules that only make sense in my use case. So in our use case, I will see, I will show you what was the thing where we were uh, using a lot of the domain knowledge that we have from people that they are usually solving these questions for the community or building the product and, and, and for them was more familiar uh, many of the product uh, questions that we found in the data set. So now we say why I want to answer the how. So we started with defining certain uh, guidelines. So first of all, we said we need to spend a decent amount of time uh, understanding the data. Because one thing that I don't know if you have seen, if you follow social networks, especially Twitter, Nowadays, it looks like at every problem, you just want to throw an LLM and see what's up, see what will happen, let's see what. And uh, so we said, no, let's not do that. Let's not throw LLMs to the problem. Let's not uh, uh, spin up GPUs. Let's first spend some time with the data. Let's see what we can uh, learn from it. Let's confront it with the domain knowledge that we also have and other experts. And from there, then, let's go to define predictive and generative tasks. So this is when we said, maybe we can use regular machine learning for this specific thing. This could be a rule and this I will use generative AI for this specific use case. And then we said, and this is huge uh, data set. So let's start by finding what are those low hanging fruits or also known as more problems. And let's start from there. So we said, and this cannot be done in isolation. We have to iterate and refine these questions and these assumptions and these guidelines by sharing it with the people that have the domain knowledge that we want to do. In this case, we were talking a lot with uh, people from support engineering, the, the engineers from support. They were saying, look, we are seeing this. Does it make sense? Yes, no, maybe it's that. So this help us to refine the data science process. And now the what. So actually what was important what was uh, the philosophy that we're going to use and now the what. So this is the low hanging fruit number one that I wanted to highlight. So imagine this is a real question that comes from Stack Overflow. Here is the link to it, where someone is asking how to define certain permissions to use GitLab and Kubernetes. So here is where comes the, what is important for your own use case and why domain knowledge is so relevant and that then you can build rules. So if you pass this through a regular entity recognition or an LLM, most likely it will be, first of all, we have a lot of questions and it will be unfeasible to feed all of these thousand of, of questions to an LLM just to maybe get something that doesn't necessarily uh, is uh, good. So here we said for us, there are many uh, issues that they are probably uh, were relevant in GitLab 15, but that in GitLab 17, they disappear because there were upgrades or maybe some feature evolved to a certain point that this problem disappeared. So here is when we started defining what is important for us if we want to address these things. For us, it's very important not only to detect uh, the entity GitLab, but we need to detect the version and the specific version because we have ways to know if something that was a problem in GitLab 15 is stopped being a problem in GitLab 17. So instead of spending time trying to troubleshoot something, maybe a good uh, a scenario will be, let's, let's, let's see the migration path and upgrade, and then your problem will be solved. So that was one. There are other tools in this uh, universe that is Kubernetes and OpenShift, for example, in this case. So there are ways using the traditional NLP, that's the, the topic of this conversation is combining the best of two words, where we said these things in many of the language models, uh, small ones, it probably is not a map there as an entity as other technology, or maybe it is. But in our use case, we wanted to aggregate it in something that makes sense for us in our team. And, and we usually call these technologies like Kubernetes or OpenShift, we put them in the same bucket called cloud native. 
So maybe for us, it would make more sense to create a dashboard when we said, look, this is a cluster of GitLab 17, and this is another cluster of Cloud Native, and we want to understand how this interacts with that. So we created an entity, a custom entity recognition, where we were going to use, where we were going to add these words that made sense for us, and pass in a pipeline that is very cheap to run using uh, Spacey Pipelines, an open source library, and then start making all of this entity recognition at scale. So here at this point, we are still not, we don't need yet uh, a language model. And we are uh, saving money and we are being uh, iterating faster by doing these things and this low hanging fruit number one. And here is where things get even, let's say, easier and more practical. If you have experience using Spacey, you see that how many of you maybe wrote uh, regex and then three days later you don't remember how is that, why is that it works? Happens all the time, right? So you, you, you better document it. So we wanted to make this scalable and in a way that is easier to understand. So we found that in this open source library, there are ways that you can use uh, this type of syntax. And we said, so we want to find the version and the version is usually accompanied by the token GitLab and something that follows like, it's like a number. So with this, we were able to collect quickly lots of versions and then aggregate them and make a cluster where we can see most of the problems are happening in this version of GitLab with respect to the other. And this one, the low hanging fruit number two, uh, is the second pattern that is called like URL. One of the things in the first step that I mentioned inspecting the data is that I noticed that lots of people when they were struggling doing something or they had some questions, they were adding a link to the public documentation. So I said, I tried this, or this doesn't work like this, or I'm trying to follow this. So we said maybe can be also that our public documentation requires better examples. So it would be good to know a cluster where we have technologies and a ranking of the URLs from our public documentation that are being shared. And then we can find correlations. If lots of people were sending links with the installation of, of Kubernetes cluster. So maybe it wasn't even a problem from, from GitLab per se, the product, maybe it's poor documentation in how, how to integrate it with another technology. So this, you see that makes sense for us, not necessarily for every use case. So that's why we start by inspecting the data and seeing what can we code, what, what business rules can we uh, get out of the steel of the machine learning process? Because we, at this point, we, we don't need machine learning yet. We just need to extract these patterns and start doing aggregations and counting occurrences to start shedding light into the size of this problem and the cost of the problem at the end of the day. So here, the first outcome that is still we didn't spend hundreds or thousands of dollars was to create these two patterns, pass this vast data set through that NLP pipeline, and then we got already the first uh, better problems. Let's say we have certain problems, now we have a better problem. We say, so does it mean that we need to improve the documentation? Maybe we need to put more examples. Now we start uh, shedding light into uh, how it can be. And this is screenshot that you see here is the second part of the initial question where you see that people usually say, I try to follow this and this link. So start giving us ideas or where we should pay more attention. And second, when I was talking about the custom entity recognition, there are also ways where here we can start playing with the new technologies like LLMs. So we said, let's, let's define what makes sense for us. So whatever is Kubernetes, OpenShift or something, we will just put, call it Cloud Native. So we created a label called, called Cloud Native and pattern. We added many, but lots of people write it like this instead of Kubernetes. And something that is very relevant for us when it comes to CI, CI is understanding how people, if they are struggling with the GitLab runners, these virtual machines that we use to execute jobs in a pipeline. So, and authentication because the, almost every product, uh, it doesn't live in isolation. You need single sign-on, you need LDAP, you need to sign to that use authentication and authorization for that uh, product. So we, that was also relevant for us using domain knowledge. We say many, many of the issues to get started is not even with the technology itself, is because they cannot log in. And when they cannot log in, what is going on? Maybe it's an LDAP thing. So maybe we need to, to enhance uh, the documentation or create how-to tutorials in, in that realm. And here is where the cool things about LLMs start also to happen. You just need to define what are your entities, like I did here, like Kubernetes is this, you take an example, then you can fit a lot 
to the large language model and you say create a JSON like this and using the template that I already gave you. So in this case, the LLM was helping us to annotate the data when we, when we gave it some examples. And then we could scale data annotation, providing an example, and then we got lots of, uh, we, we were able to populate this JSON to later use it like this. So here you see that at this point in the, in the traditional NLP pipeline that we were doing, we're saying, let's load a model, let's read from this JSON L file where we have all our custom entities, the ones that are usually uh, not available in a preterm model, and let's add it to my uh, NLP pipeline. And you, you do it by enabling this entity ruler, and let's put it before the normal or the traditional entity recognition because in the documentation, it says that if you first put in the pipeline the normal entity recognition, it, it will give priority first to that one instead of your custom one. So imagine this is, a, this is a pipeline, step by step, I want it to give priority to my custom entities and then use the regular NER uh, to find other entities such as organizations, name, or numbers, and so on. And we read it from file. So at this point, this is pure NLP, tagging, uh, data annotation, pipelines, doing entity recognition, custom entity recognition. And so far we got the help from LLM, helping us to annotate data, giving an example. And the output, which is when things get even more interested, is that you can uh, generate a JSON file with all of these things that are relevant to me. So you can see that here we said after running this NLP pipeline, we get uh, this JSON that I can define how I want it where we have that entity GitLab version 17, the, in this case, it wasn't specified if it was on-prem or SaaS. And the, another key was what are the technologies that we call cloud native that are related to that specific um, uh, issue or question and the text in natural language as the user wrote it. So once we have it from here, the data is structured and we, then the sky is the limit. You can do whatever with it. You can put it in dashboards. You can do more things then. In our case, we will start using LLMs with it. But this is where, where you want to be. You want to take something that is deterministic, write certain rules, and then get to a point where you are taking your data, data from natural language and having it usable to, to enable more use cases. And now, extending what was happening here, so you see that we use domain knowledge to create certain rules and we use the matcher in Spacey to find those patterns that we were interested. We define certain uh, entities that were uh, relevant to our use case. And here we start bridging with the other part that is the, the foundation of what is going on today with all the lamps, which is from there. Now I'm going to take this text that you see here in the JSON file and I'm going to convert it into embeddings. And once I have these embeddings, I want to create clusters based on these embeddings and measure which ones are using this causing similarity and causing distance. The, what are the, 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 how similar are the different embeddings to each other and create clusters with that. And once I create the clusters, I use the good and old TF IDF to say, I'm gonna read documents from each cluster and I'm gonna select only the ones that are the most relevant or they have the most weight. So do you recall this algorithm, TF-IDF? I like to think of that algorithm that if your manager tells you that everything is important, so nothing is important. Because if the word important appears in every request, so not, not everything can be important. So if everything is important, nothing is important. So this algorithm helps you to do something like that. You have a bunch of documents, let's say here, a bunch of questions about product usage, and it will extract questions that appear a lot but if they appear in all the documents, maybe they are a word that doesn't add too much weight. But if you have 10 documents and one of them says Kubernetes only once, so maybe that's a, a word that you should pay attention because it's unique. But if it says Kubernetes in all of them, so maybe Kubernetes is not that relevant and the problem is other. So this is what we do when, we, we, when I call it count and weight. And this is a concept from regular uh, information retrieval and natural language processing. The difference is that it's being applied to a cluster of documents and the cluster was found using embeddings, which is a little bit more modern than the regular NLP. So at the end of the day, when I take questions uh, about product usage and I pass it through all of these pipelines that you see here, this is the output that my NLP pipeline is giving me. 
And this output here are keywords that are highly descriptive of what was going on in certain cluster of topics. So you see that when, when you have been working with this thing and you are the one that has been coding it and having interviews with domain knowledge people, you are already a lot in the topic. So you, you can start reading between the lines and you can autocomplete that these keywords, what is the problem about in this cluster? And that's when we, when we said it would be great to take the clusters, the main documents, the keywords and pass it through an LLM and ask it, giving it some prompts to generate something that is human readable or maybe, or maybe make a summary. And you see that one of the, the things that we were trying to do here and we achieved is that the search space is very narrow. This is all the input that the LLM has to create something. So this is what is, has been uh, our friends from Spacey and Explosion, they are calling a retrieval augmentation or something like that. Instead of RAG, this is retrieval augmentation. So you are reducing your search space using a regular machine learning or deterministic uh, outputs to generate these keywords and then the LLM will take from there, will generate something. So you are already narrowing the search space, which I spoil my uh, next slide because this is what we wanted to, to do. I didn't want an LLM making sentences up, getting it from a vast uh, corpus that it has probably, actually before we did this, the LLM was uh, suggesting solutions because ha have you seen if you have been using them or evaluating them, they are like people pleasers. You ask them to do something and they want to go extra mile doing more. So, so you said, no, I don't want you to tell me much about it. Just take this and give me a sentence that makes sense based on lots of samples that you saw from the documents that I filter out from this ranking and then make a sentence that is human readable. So effectively narrowing the search space for it to generate something. So we saw in different uh, scenarios that we could make it more verbose, more informal. So one of the outputs was using Llama 2, the assistance with GitLab 15 migration. This is something that I can, is, is cooler to read than migrate help path GitLab 15. Or when we were using it to fine tune the topic modeling, this topic was GitLab migrations. That's, that's easier to read and easier to put on a table and then for someone else to consume. So this is where we go. And now going to the documentation of Llama 2, because this is another thing. There are more powerful models, but we want to use Llama 2 because we said we don't really need the, the largest and the greatest to do this thing since we are already narrow in search space. We don't need all that computer power. And we also wanted to keep the costs low and the inference time uh, shorter. So here, the good documentation, this is nothing that I invented. We just went to the documentation and they say that usually you can, you need to prompt a model like this, three steps. The system prompt, you give an example, all the in context learning, I think they are calling around, where you say, look, this is what, what some prompt will look like. And this is a desired outcome that you can come up based on this. And then the main, the main prompt, where we are actually using the documents that were passed or that were ranked by the traditional NLP pipeline. So you see these three bullets here? These three bullets, when says can access my instance or LDAP misconfigure or need help resetting LDAP, they come from this count and weight. So there were hundreds of documents, but we said, let's just choose the top three because they are the most relevant. And this top three is what we are passing to it. And these keywords are the ones that appear and have the most of the weight in all the documents. So you see that now we are narrowing the search space to say generate a sentence, but use these documents and these keywords. And this is all in the prompt. So we define three prompts, system prompt, where you can, uh, this is optional, I think, it says in the documentation, where what you do is that you start already setting the context for the LLM. So in this case, I said you are a helpful assistant. I, I have seen recently that they are putting, you are an honest assistant. So I don't know <laughs> what, what, what they have observed by adding that. I, we, this is internal usage, so we, we say, okay, I am gonna risk, risk it that I don't need to add that one. And so going through these three steps, this is a screenshot from one of the experiments where you see that 
I put I concatenated the prompt using the the three that I defined earlier, and then when, once you pass one of the questions from the database, it generated something that is more that is easier to read than just keywords. So this was one of the uh, experiments that we were doing, and here we start seeing that what I what I mentioned in the beginning about the um, domain knowledge, we see that. At this point, this was a very specific cluster that is more about uh, integration with other tools. So we still are not there in that uh, product user thing. And this is uh, what excites me when I use these uh, data sets. When you, when you are told that you are gonna analyze some data set about uh, product questions, I wasn't, it wasn't in my, in my imagination yet that big chunk of it was going to be integration with another system that was an assumption that I didn't have, and we learned it from, from the data. I know that they said that the, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but for me, this was, this was nice to see. It was something that I wasn't expecting. Maybe someone else was, but it doesn't matter. And here, I want to share something that we extended. So if, if the, the cool thing about this, uh, because all of these things that you saw in the pipeline, you could do it, we did it in the beginning. We took all the traditional and proven algorithms, we use k-means, we use all of these things to generate our own clusters, we use LDA, um, and then we found that someone already, thanks to open source, had already thought about how to chain all of these things, and there is an open source library that is called Vertopic, where all of these things that I put, they are already chained, and you can plug and unplug. So we said, ah, okay, and there is a class inside that library that is called text generation, where you can pass certain arguments. So we extended the class to continue enhancing the prompt, but using what we extracted in a deterministic way using traditional NLP. So in the regular class, it is expecting these keywords documents that they have all the different top, uh, samples of product questions in another language and the keywords that is the output of all the pipeline where it's ranking topics. So we extended it to now also consider the different entities that we found deterministically using traditional NLP. So now the prompt, you see that you can enhance it with other things that probably for your use case are mandatory. Maybe there is some uh, here is when regulations and compliance uh, become very relevant. What if you have to filter anything that looks like an organization name from public sector or something like that. And you already have what are those organizations that you need to filter. So maybe you can create a custom, custom entity and in the prompt say, exclude all the entities from this field that I deterministically found using regular uh, NLP. You don't wanna risk it to pass it through an LLM and give some examples and see, let's see if it works and hopefully it will because this is what can be happening. In this case, we are reducing the, the area of risk. Let's call it like that. But, but it's, it's, the search space is being reduced significantly. So I promise also architecture. And if you wanna take pictures, this is the moment. This is the very high level, I sometimes call it architecture, because this, this is hiding most of the, the coding and things and modules that were uh, uh, built on, in behind. But here we see that we have a data set. We had to select timeframes and reliable plans because there are different types of, I mean, the, 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 our data set had different things that we said this we don't need. And also we have like 10 years of questions and we said we don't, we don't want the, the 10 years old. So we started by filtering something uh, more recent. And then certain fields for GDPR or other things that were completely irrelevant and we didn't need. And then internal request, this was another that was very interesting for us as well to learn that from this bunch of, of data, one important cluster was internal request. People saying, how can I do this? But they, they were already uh, employees. So it's okay, so we just found out that we need to probably do something in the onboarding or we need to create some entry in our handbook where we are explaining a process that apparently is not clear because look that they are asking here. This was also not necessarily uh, intuitive and this internal request also learn us to help what can we improve from, from our process. And it's very important to keep always some human in the loop. So we were validating and inspecting 
after all of this uh, NLP was applied, we were validating and inspecting the data, seeing that maybe there is something that uh, at that point in time uh, we should remove or there is, uh, you know, using some human judgment before we will put that into the algorithm that was going to calculate the different topics. And from here, once we had the topics, you see that it's very easy because we also stored a timestamp to answer different questions that I said in the beginning. We wanted to look at the progression of topics over time. And we could definitely see that something that was very important in June it stopped being import that important in November on the same year. And, and for me, as a data scientist, I was like, okay, interesting. But then when you ask someone in domain knowledge, they said, yes, there was a big upgrade there. Or even other things. This is when kids were uh, coming back from holidays. So people were on vacation, so they opened more tickets. So that's why. I was like, ah, okay. Only the one who works there, they can make more sense of what we were, or the dashboard that we were displaying and topics by frequency and topics by distance, like how far is, for example, LDAP from GitLab Runner. And if they are close, it, will, it is interesting to understand why is it close. And then you dig, dig, dig deeper in the data and you say, oh, maybe because they are trying to use the runner with an external service and a secret token, blah, 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 blah. And then from the topics is where we go into the LLM and generative uh, AI realm, where we take different documents and the keywords that were found by the previous and um, tested algorithms to do topic modeling. And then we were refining the topics or generating human readable sentence, uh, using them for what they are good at, generating language, but from a narrower uh, space. So my three takeaways from this is that first you define the rules that are relevant to your goals. In this case, I mentioned the version of, the, of, of GitLab, the links that we wanted to find. Then we use those rules to apply traditional NLP, and they, that will help us to narrow the, the generation space using a structure, remember the JSON? And that opens the door that maybe we need smaller models that we can fine tune for this specific use case. So don't worry that much if you don't have enough memory or you don't have a big GPU. Maybe if you do all of these things, you can use a, small, a smaller model fine tune that you can run your computer or in a cheaper, a virtual machine, which is what we ended up doing uh, after all of these things. A um, big part of the outcomes is that you, we, we discovered some blind spots, as I mentioned, things that when we were writing the different assumptions, there were some that appeared there what we didn't know. Another outcome was the um, technical content. The famous is not a, is a feature, not a bug. We say, okay, no, this is not a bug. Look, actually in the docs, we wrote this. It would be helpful to do this. Why? Because we're learning from the frustration associated with certain links by applying this pipeline. So it, technical writing teams, they, they were able to say, okay, let's revise this part because probably it's not clear. And it also helped us to, at least for the support team, they do something that is called knowledge articles. They said, if I know that this is a, now that we see the different clusters where there are lots of uh, questions that relate, maybe it would be great to write a tutorial explaining this and we put it in the portal online in the forum. So before someone opens a ticket or goes to Stack Overflow or something, maybe they will find this and they will answer their questions. So now what we are doing was basically having data-driven uh, decision in where to focus when we create content that is also very relevant for, for my team. Sometimes we have to decide, okay, I want to write a blog, but about what? With this, I already have some input of something that might be relevant and, and the likelihood of, of, of the content being useful increases just because of this. At least if someone asks me, I have data to prove why I made that decision. Second one is the enhancing of the public documentation, the, thanks to the pattern, nothing fancy, just reading links. And the third one is that GitLab released recently, I think, I'm not really sure now, something called GitLab University, where there, are, there is an outline of topics. And when this happened, we told them, look, we found this. And they say, we have a bunch of data and a material for that. So we'll make, we, we will make sure to put it as part of the curriculum in certain certification. Because we saw, according to the question, that that was relevant to, to, for them to learn. So I wanted to show you also a little bit of code where I was combining everything. 
So here you see that the traditional NLP using Spacey, which is a very powerful uh, library to, do, to define the matcher, the, the stop words, but still in, in some cases is, is relevant. And here I was just passing all of these things. And of course, I cannot show you the data set that I was using for this. So I just went and downloaded the movies data set from Kaggle. And look, no LLM, and I already found something that I believe is quite concerning. From 1,000 movies, you see that most of the, when you clean the data set, the words or tokens that appear are man, life, young, fine, woman. So what, you, you're going to start asking questions, right? Like, is it all most of the movies about a live, uh, young man? Well, <laughs> Yes, that, that, that starts shedding light, like where to, and if you are a person that knows about cinema, then you will have deeper questions in my case, it's just an outsider perspective. And then I, I plot the frequency of regular tokens, no lemmas, and it was the same, young man, life, family, woman. So, okay, this I, that doesn't sound too inclusive to me. Most of the, the movies, look, the top from IMDb apparently are about young men. And yeah, World War, uh, America, German, yeah. and here. So I was applying this uh, library that basically defines the pipeline that I show you, where it's combining the topic modeling with clusters and reduction of features because these are very big uh, vectors, so you need to make it shorter uh, for computing and so on. And the embeddings using this very small model to calculate them, and this all uh, stacking all of these things together and defining metrics, basically you, you, you pass the data to this uh, algorithm and it will start calculating embeddings, transforming documents, and then it will give you the different uh, distance and so on. So this was for this data set that you saw is highly, uh, what is it called, imbalanced, let's, let's, let's say, for men, young, life. So you can see also here the different, the, the distance between uh, the clusters and a very nice view of how they look like when you plot them in a 2D space. And then you can see the nicely defined clusters here. So this is what uh, we create, no LLM included, but let's close it here. So now in, a, in another one, when you say, okay, I did the training and now I want to try uh, the LAMA model. So in th this case, it's uh, an example where they were using a data set of uh, scientific papers. But the, the thing was the same. They were saying, look, when, when you do the regular topic modeling, you get these keywords uh, separated by commas. But when you use something like LAMA2 and you feed these keywords, the, the topics are easier to read for the human eye. So this is exactly the same concept illustrated with a different data set of everything that I explained. And it's very easy to use. The difficult part, I will say, is asking the right questions in the beginning and defining the rules that make sense to you. So whatever you get here is more meaningful than just throwing more LLM and compute power uh, at your problem. And I finished right on time, it's just one minute. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope you like it and I will be around if you have questions. I'll be here if you want to ask me and I will share the code and the repo of all of these things you want to follow along with the notebooks. Where will you share it? Hmm? Where will you share it? In the presentation, I will upload it and then in the agenda, I think from there you can download the PDF and click on analytics.